Yeah, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, when people wander in, we'll just make them introduce themselves when they wander in. So, since we're doing this round table style, what I'll do is I'll, I'll read the our thing. God, I'm just so tired. I'm sorry, guys. Our description. There we go. I'm not going to do a lot of carry in the conversation this time. Just so you guys know. Um, and then we'll go around and we'll introduce ourselves, um, as we have historically do, but not always. And then we'll just jump into the conversation. Okay. Okay, um, so we're here for emotional manipulation of the reader. As readers, what are we willing to tolerate as far as emotional manipulation? When does the author go too far, breaking our trust in the implied contract between the reader and the writer? As writers, because I'm assuming we all are here, uh, what are some techniques for manipulation of the emotions of the reader? How do we skirt that line between manipulating their emotions without breaking trust? Other topics the roundtable would like to discuss about the topic are welcome. Hi, I'm Michael Merriam. I'm a uh, co-organizer. Uh, I'm like this group's first officer or something like that. Um, second in charge. We have a captain. We don't see her very much anymore. But we do have a captain. Um, and I'm also reading for the anthology. Um, I will be reading for the anthology uh, probably next week, I'm thinking, week after next. I'm having some demo surgery done week after next, so I thought, well, I was hopped up on drugs. That would be a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> I um, sent you the wrong story then. <laughs> 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 to, to break out the slush. Um, an um, interesting slush. It'll be an interesting <laughs> slush pile at that point. <laughs> So, emotional manipulation of the reader is our topic. Do we want to talk about that from the writer point of view or the reader point of view first? Don't everybody jump in at once. Yes. <laughs> yes. Re reader point of view would, would give us a better understanding of where we were coming from as writers. Would be my thought. I think comprehending things as a reader first is, is generally more important. Well, but that's just our readers point. first. Mm -hmm. I agree that you become a fan and then you start to want to write. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go ahead. Yeah, let's do the readers first. Well, can we get Game of Thrones out of the way just to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to just. I'm, very excited. I'm just going to say this up front right now. I still haven't read a damn Game of Thrones right now. You're not missing I don't any of the, of the, of the, of the show. And I refuse I heard to do it until either George finishes the series or he dies. I've heard that you're, that you're missing pretty stuff on the show, but... Meh. So, so, as a reader, then, what, what are you willing to, uh, what are you willing to put up with from an author as far as mo emotional manipulation? And what aren't you? What is too far? Honestly, it, it's gonna end up being really subjective for me. I mean, um... You know, I, I can think of specific times when I've seen something and it's just been, I mean, frustrating, essentially, where, I mean, it's like, well, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it's just, you know, I mean, why are they doing this? It's very obvious that they're only doing it so that, you know, it'll, you know, make me feel sad or attached to this character or something like that. And usually it seems like that backfires, but of course it's not to say that I never become attached to characters. So, <laughs> I mean, um... I, I guess it's really more a matter of subtlety for me because I mean if you notice it then it, it usually doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, if I can see through it I'm much less likely to be happy about it. I'd say part of that is uh, when you see through it it's because it seems to be a thing that sticks out from the rest of the book as opposed to something that rises up organically from the plot. So it's the oh crap, that didn't work, I'll just throw a fish hook over here and, and that'll totally catch them as opposed to, oh, they're in the middle of a fishing shop and there are naturally fish hooks everywhere or something. So it's kind of a, it's not so much <coughs> thing as its surroundings, I guess I would say, that makes it work or not work for me. The massacre isn't sad enough, let's throw in an innocent child. <laughs> they, uh, okay, they had... Uh, one of the, uh, one of the co-authors of the Left Behind series says, "Hold down the preachiness," which is 
But uh, one thing that I uh, note that emotional manipulation can fail drastically. For example, I know somebody who uh, read an uh, who was uh, read an ad saying this product can make you look ten years younger. She was eighteen. Because <laughs> I want to look eight. Because I want to look eight. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 So other, come on, come on, go to work. Does it vary by genre at all? The willingness to. The willingness to be with it. How much you can get away with pushing. Well, let's see. Okay. I think as a romance reader, you are willing to put up with more. Yeah. Let's see. Somehow, I don't think, uh, I don't think military novels would. Be the place to put and to try to convert readers to pacifism. <laughs> right, but at the same time, you, 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 but yeah. you, you I mean, will it can, game. Um, yeah. you know. And but the thing is too, even with military books, you're still emotionally manipulating the reader on some level, whether that's a jingoistic emotion manipulation, or you're trying to get them to, you know, like we talked about with Ender's game, where, you know. You look at that, and you get a little horrified at what happens. Frankly, I finally got around to reading that. Another one of those great classic books I had never read. And and I went in and read that as an adult, and I'm like, well, that's pretty horrifying, isn't it? Huh. Wow. He really did that. Huh. Okay. So. So, so, so that is. Oh. So there's a function of like just how jaded. How jaded you are as a reader. <laughs> you are as a reader. Yeah, I mean, as uh, I, I don't know, from my personal experience, I, like, the stuff I read when I was a teenager is just powerful and incredible, and when I go back to read it again as an adult, um, it loses some of it to uh, sparkle because of just how much exposure I've had to other things that were like that. Yeah. And maybe on another note, um, you know, I wonder how, I wonder how early on in the story that is, I mean, as to what's acceptable uh, and what crosses the line. I wonder what, how much of that depends on how early it's introduced into the story. Like, for instance, we we established in the very first episode of the TV series Breaking Bad that Walter White has uh, cancer. Um, if that had been in an alternate universe introduced in the second season or third season, like yeah. just all of a sudden he gets cancer in the second or third season. Um, I'm not sure that it would generate as much sympathy um, just because of the, uh, the incredulity that you know the audience mm -hmm. might have for that sort of thing. So, and, and in that case, the cancer was is in, in sight. The incitement for the whole setup. Mm -hmm. it, it gave him doing the bad, a good reason to do this bad thing. Yeah. He would have had a really hard time accepting this high school science teacher just sort of making math for kicks. Yeah, maybe the first two seasons were taken from Malcolm in the Middle. There's one and Naomi Kritzer did some rather sneaky emotional manipulation. I can't remember the title of the book, but essentially there is the ecologically conscious old, a persecuted old religion and the, and the anti-ecological persecuting new religion. And Except it turns out the old religion is Christianity, the new religion is neo paganism. So I think you get into that whole sort of like Drew just said, and, and we're kind of sliding over to the writer stuff now, and, and Aubrey with her fish hooks. Um, sitting on the ground ahead of time. So I'm going to slide us now a little over into the writer stuff. Um, what are some useful techniques you think for doing that, for being able to get that emotional reaction that you want to get from the reader? I'd like to make a suggestion. Sure, go ahead. Um, what I see that stands out to me that bothers me is lazy stuff, relying on stereotypes, like the innocent child. 
mm -hmm. as opposed to building up a character's complexity so that you understand them and care about them. I think part of it has to do with um, the whole picture, actually. Um, when you're painting the portrait of this character in the beginning, uh, oftentimes you will start off with something like an archetype or just something like a prototype. But, um, you know, if it's fleshed out and if it's filled out or filled out with, um, like, realistic detail. Especially detail that defies the stereotype. Yes, if you're building against type, um, then it could work. Like, you can have somebody who's suffering from cancer, but you also make them a school teacher, you also make them, you know, a, uh, you know, a father of one, expecting another, and then you just build the picture up from from the ground level. It's it all it I guess it all goes into um, if you know writing were portraiture, it's how realistic is the painting basically. And it could be an honest little detail. So I read this book once that I really liked um, Farthing by Joe Walton. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, one of the one of the point of view characters goes back and forth is this uh, um, gruff police officer, and he's you know with the Scotland Yard yard stereotype. And you find find out pretty early on that he is a northerner, and he has to be careful about his accent. It was just what this one little uh, uh, passing mention, and all of a sudden I was rooting for the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't know, just just because of his fish out of the out of water feeling. Those nice little details that you that you can't really just make up. Mm -hmm. I, uh, last month I shared a, a checklist with a lot of Michael Hagee. He's a screenwriting guru guy, and mm -hmm. he's got a his book on uh, selling your story in 60 seconds. He's got a really nice checklist of, uh, that I like to use. Um, it is cliche or whatever, but when you apply this list to things, you start to realize, wow, that's why this works and this doesn't. But you. He suggests having two traits um, in the very first scene of any character, whether they're a villain or a protagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, and two of the five traits you want to have is something like an injustice. Okay, the classic would be, you know, they're uh, homeless, they're orphaned, that type of a thing. Uh, that's undeserved. Okay, so you feel sorry for them. Okay, the next one would be uh, there's some type of threat. It could be a uh, physical threat, it could be financial bankruptcy, something like that, or danger. The third trait uh, is somehow they're likable uh, by other people, or did you like them uh, for some reason, some, some aspect of their Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. The fourth element is there's some humor uh, associated with them. Maybe you're <laughs> laughing at them or making other crappy jokes. And the fifth is they've got some unique skill or they're powerful. And if you have two of any of those five, for whatever reason, it's a recipe that works pretty good for why you're like, oh, I'm interested in this character. Mm -hmm. You don't even care about the plot yet, but this character is somebody that um, I suddenly have some empathy with, have some you know, an emotional attachment to. So that's something that I started to, to use personally, and I, uh, I found it works pretty good when you find, especially in your first page or first chapter, you've got to connect pretty quick nowadays because Question about that. Um, so, getting these two out of five across, uh, is that something that you want to get done by the first page? Or? Well, it, it depends. And even the and the, the short story I brought in last time threw that rules completely out. I had no protagonist. You know, things like that. I mean, it was uh, as an unusual kind of a story for people saw it. But um, you know, there are exceptions to any rule. This is a guideline. So, um, so again, back to your question again is. Just can you repeat your question? Yeah, um, yeah. How quickly do we want to get these across, like in a novel or? Yeah. Story? You know, when I've seen it work, it's generally you're talking about in your first, by the end of the first chapter for sure, you might have a twist, and then your exciting incident that creates the injustice or the threat, for example. But you know, the sooner the better to try to create some intrigue. Um, uh, about the character, if it's that type of a story that has a protagonist, um, uh, where you want to manipulate uh, something that way, 
characters, or think they're a villain, like a uh, um, gray-haired woman you know, by Neil Gaiman, Neil Gaiman, where you're following you start with the assassin. You know, this is a powerful, skilled guy with this razor sharp you know, knife. He's walking around and killing a family. So you're like, okay, wow, well, this guy is. He is the threat. Uh, he's not likable. He's just the opposite, and he's very skilled and powerful. So uh, it's, like, it's interesting to play with that model. Except there are exceptions, though, depending on the story. So, yeah, but faster is better. I mean, but there's there's all kinds of exceptions. You know, uh, especially the older stories. Right. Uh, turning that around, I've I've read stories where the the protagonist or the or the villain is just too perfect. And then there's no empathy. I actually have read stories where I wish the damn character would die <laughs> <laughs> or, or get hit by a bus or something because it's just like too, too uh, superhero ish or too, um, too utterly moi ha ha villain. You know? <laughs> um, that is just kind of laughable and falls into a stereotype of perfection. Is that in a screenplay sense, this two out of five? I bet it happens in the first five minutes of seeing a character. Yeah. And the most, the first time the character's on screen, for you know somebody's going to be in the movie significantly, but it happens really quickly. One of, one of my readers, uh, one of my novels, I was trying to figure out how the chapters lined up, and she said, well, you know, she read the first seven chapters, and she said, okay, you had me until this point, and it took me out mm -hmm. of the story, and. You have to make sure that whatever you're doing is not removing you from the rhythm of the story. If something takes you out, whatever it is, it can be very minute, like something's out of place in a room, that if that happens, then you kind of lose your reader. And if you lose rhythm in writing as well when that happens, I know something's wrong. I read a book not too long ago where um, the first two chapters, she had the protagonist, and she was setting up the general theme of the story and everything about the third chapter. She introduced a new guy, and he was working out at the gym on a rowing machine, and he was, you know, a little overweight. His cholesterol was bad. His 50 year, his uh, daughter came in, his adult daughter. They'd been estranged for a while. They were getting back together again. He really felt for this guy and his daughter, but he didn't know where he fit in the story yet until he got to the meeting that he had to go to when he got done, and it was to meet the mob boss to find out who he was going to kill next. Mm -hmm. you know, so that that was kind of a shocker. I hadn't seen it done exactly that way before because they didn't get into his life a whole lot until then, but you saw him as a, as a whole person right off the bat. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think I it's, it's kind of cool, actually. I think it's interesting that um, a lot of the discussion about emotional manipulation is centered around the reader, uh, it's the reader's relationship to the characters. Um, you, you, I guess, you, you don't think about like emotional manipulation like, you know, dry description of horrific events or, uh, uh, or just some long running chronicle about a certain beleaguered peoples. It's, it's, Maybe the most direct way to go about it is just is it's the focus on character, how that relates to the reader, and all the different kinds of sympathetic reactions uh, that uh, the reader would have for that character. It has to be personal, and and I think a lot of times what I see is a character who's introduced specifically for that purpose. They're they're somehow going to be a motivation for the protagonist, their love interest, they're someone that, that has to be rescued, they're who knows what it is. Oh, um, oh yes. <laughs> and and sometimes it's a little too obvious that that's all they're doing there. Because they don't want anything for themselves. The character that exists to serve another to character. Serve another character. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can save a lot of and a lot of work you keep in mind that you know, that all your readers and all your characters have the same sexual taste and the same taste in other things. What? However, the, however, there are certain problems with this approach, to say the least. 
Yeah, so I guess it's, I mean, it's the idea that, um, you know, while we're all unique, we're only unique in so many ways. We're all human. And for finding a target reader, um, it would really behoove you to, uh, to, I guess it would, be, it would behoove you to find a target reader that uh, uh, fits into a certain kind of niche or a certain kind of, uh, I guess, a certain stereotype. Oh, making a face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, uh, I don't like that theory. What? I don't like that theory. I uh, I didn't say I liked it. I said it would say it saves a lot of work. I didn't say you said you would like it. I was talking mm -hmm. to Boo and saying oh. I don't like mm -hmm. the theory. Okay. Well, I was maybe just putting something out yep. there. Uh -huh. Who knows? So why don't you like the theory, Andre? Yeah. Because uh, there's a certain basic quality to human existence that people can relate to the other if you if you reveal what's going on inside. You don't want to have uh, to write to some stereotyped typical reader. It's not going to work. It's going to make everything bland and the same. I think people, especially in speculative fiction, people come looking for the other and you want to give it to them. I heard some voices pop up. It's, a, it's kind of a balancing act, perhaps, between keeping a character relatable and yet providing enough new, enough of a new experience to engage the interest of the reader. Because the reader's going there for a new thing, but they're also going there for the thing that they know that they like. So both of you are right, <laughs> um, I would say, I would guess. Um, I think that uh, it's where you draw the lines on how much familiar and how much different and where you put the familiar and where you put the different, that is what changes uh, the characters and the reaction to the characters and how sympathetic they are. Kind of like that example of the guy who, oh, this is a sympathetic character because he's you know dealing with his daughter, and oh, he's a hitman. <coughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's the sympathetic and there's the other, which is an an, an, exo an exoticized other. Hitmen are exoticized in our culture, um, which provides the the thrill of the different, the the cognitive the, the pleasurable cognitive dissonance um, that uh, readers might enjoy. And it could be, um, I guess it could be a genre thing too, like, uh, depending on the genre, you can get really out there with your choice of main character. Uh, whereas, I don't know if you're writing romance, uh, I, I have a picture of what mainstream romance is like. I don't actually read much of it, so this is mm -hmm. kind of what I think it looks like. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, careful. But your main character has got to be kind of like an every woman, right? I I mean, she could have an exotic position, she could be a lawyer, and everything. but uh, when it comes to mainstream romance, is it a requirement for your character, um, I guess, to be sort of like a reflection of the reader? I was just wondering how. If, if you had a scale about likability going up and similarity to a given reader here mm -hmm. going across, to what degree are those two things? Is this a, a direct line? Is it there, a, is an not? uncanny valley peak? Yeah, yeah. 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 does it go? I know, I know the author in the Twilight series, uh, the main character, I think it's Bella, was written so vaguely that every young woman or woman mm -hmm. or what reader could put themselves into her position. And that was just, it was just, if you, and if you watched any of it, you go, yeah, there's no explanation of who she really is, but so it really does make it vague, so it really can draw anybody in. So the setting make that Yeah, it's likeable? the setting more. It's the setting and the characters around Bella that make more. Secondary character. Yeah. yeah, it's the secondary. It's like Doctor, well, Doctor Who, well, is the Doctor Who's the same way. The stories are about the companions <coughs> more than they are about the Doctor. It's the, companion's journey, not, not the doctor's journey so much. Oh, and for the whole um, relatability thing, look at teen and young adult science fiction and fantasy. Who are the heroes? Are they the, the idiot jock? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the people who are reading those books. It's it's who we were when we were growing up nerds. They're the ones who, who are the heroes of the story.
you know, you're, kind of, you're kind of talking about the uh, the contract you were mentioning before. Mm -hmm. When I picked up this book and decided to read it, I was making some assumptions about what it would be like. Mm -hmm. So there are some emotional manipulations that are not going to work, mm -hmm. and some are going to work really well. Right. Like you were saying earlier, you, especially in a romance, you don't want to make a character that's so nice you want to kill it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he's got to end up getting the girl and you like it. There's that. rules, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is rules. Yeah. yeah. And knowing them and knowing them to break them. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think in many cases, the readers want a character who is like them but better. I think as bad as some, the art becomes better. Yeah, or as bad as the art becomes better. Yeah. yeah. And cause, because that's, a lot of times, that's the art. Mm. Uh, but you especially see that in one to me. fiction, is that's the art. This is instantly a relatable character. They are a lot like me, but they become better, or make better choices, or have more interesting lives, quite frankly, yeah. um, than I do. So I heard you. Can't see you. <laughs> Let me see what I'm exactly looking. Like. You just said what I was doing. Uh, Say better. Sorry. Good job. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about Conrad's comment about really good characters. We don't like them just because they're too perfect and whatnot. And I have an example of the, the name of the Wind books. You know, I have no reason I should like this character. He is very similar. She's being too good at everything, but I'm signing up for every time one of those books comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why, what makes that work. Is so, it character so or is it other work? stuff? Yeah, what does make that work? What is resonating inside you that you have to pick that book up? Uh, I know I'm a sucker for world building. Okay. So, and it's, while that book is world built, it's not particularly great at it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work really deep, it doesn't tell you anything. It's also a deeper examination of storytelling than most of the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a lot of pains to sort of point out the issues with storytelling in particular. And I mean, they've got a handful of interludes where he's explicitly changing details of the narrative uh, that don't make it into, like, the book and that kind of thing. And so, I mean, if nothing else, you can sympathize with him as a writer. <laughs> no, it's, it's hard to say what makes a book work, especially because it, it works differently for different people. And that's why, you know, there are that many books that just everybody loves. Uh, the Harry Potter books, yeah, I mean, that's really popular. There are people who don't care for it, um, but the people who do care for it don't all like it for the same reason. I, for instance, think Harry is an insufferable twit. <laughs> and, I agree with and you. I've read the books for Hermione. I like Ron. Ron is <laughs> And his brothers. Yeah. But you know that, like you said, and like you said, that's part of the contract between the reader and the author, and the reader in the book, too. You go in for the world building. You know, you you've read Harry Potter, and and that contract that got built over time was you and Hermione, and so that could have been broken at some point. She could have gone a direction and completely gone off the rails for you as a reader. Assuming you can write all the characters, does having a cast of characters mm -hmm. increase your odds of relating to more people or not? Mm -hmm. As opposed to books with a single, single strong protagonist. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I always wondered that about, I mean, like the Game of Thrones series. I know we got all that out of the way, but... Uh, <laughs> That's uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we barely started. Lord of the Rings if you want. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if the popularity of the series is because there's just so much for people to see in it, potentially. Until they're dead. Until they're gone. Part, uh, part of the popularity, I think, is that it, the, is that the, uh, it, uses, uh, it, it uses devices which sophisticated readers don't need, but it appeals, it, it was written as, in such a way, uh, they were written in such a way that the books appeal to people who don't read fiction much. You know, that's a good point, and I wonder, you know, Dan brings that up. Um, and I wonder if you just start talking about the contract between the reader and the book. The really successful books, do they, they make different contracts, probably, don't they? they? They make a contract with readers who don't read a lot. 
um, but for whatever reason, they resonate with readers who don't read well. But if they're going to have staying power, they also have to resonate with the fairly sophisticated readers as well. And that's a different contract, frankly. That's a different thing that you're you're looking for as a reader writer. I'm trying to figure out, you know, if we all knew how to do that, we'd all be bestsellers. <laughs> but uh, but as, as the discussion we had earlier, there really is no magic bullet. Well, I did come here expecting to be told. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, I want my money back. <laughs> I, 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 you, didn't, you didn't give me a big enough check for the secret handshake. <laughs> you to the level I'm at, which isn't really any better than the level you're at. So, so you just have to do something Ponzi somewhere between and Masons and Pyramids. Here, and and so. this actually sounds like okay. So, if there was a um, uh, let's say an imaginary writer with this unlimited capability to produce any book that he wanted to regardless of what he was like inside, or he or she. I wonder if there would be a two-pronged approach of putting out um, a mass-market book with broad appeal and, you know, with targeted to the widest audience possible, and then putting out a second book that would be his more personal book, that, um, I guess, that his labor of love book, and have all the sales of the mass market book drive sales of, of the uh, the uh, more obscure and personal uh, writing. I think real writers do this, but they use pseudonyms. Yeah, well, I think that they do that and use pseudonyms. I think that they also do that as their careers advance. Um, you can see this sometimes um, with writers who have been very successful for a long time, and now they can pretty much they can write that book of their heart and everything they'll have a built-in audience. Um, you know, you look at a guy like Stephen King, you know, who churned out fairly formulaic, um, you know, horror novels for years and years, but then that allowed him to start to write some things that he really wanted to write that wouldn't be recognized. Um, Charles Delant is another guy who did that. Um, you know, he churned out that? some... Charles Delant um, uh, wrote some fairly, you know, and on some levels, he is the grandfather of urban fantasy, sort of like Emma Bull is, is the fairy godmother of urban fantasy. Um, but some of his books, at a point, kind of had a little bit of a sameness to them, and they sold really well, and that allowed him to make enough money to write some things that didn't, that weren't things that made me as regular urban fantasy fans would have enjoyed. Um, and so I think that you can do it two ways. I think that there are also authors who do that pseudonym-wise, um, because they brand, they, they have that unique brand, that unique, you know, Patterson, King, Danielle Steele brand. Um, but then, you know, under another name, they're, they're writing, you know, like I said, you know, the, the book of their heart or whatever. So. I think another example of that would be uh, John Grisham's first novel was actually A Time to Kill, and it was written about his um, concerns for. Um, I guess politics and the legal system in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. um, apocryphally, he had to hand sell that at some point mm -hmm. and like make a limited print run that he actually had to pay kind of upfront for. His second novel, um, The Firm, became a mega bestseller, a huge bestseller. And um, the reason we know about A Time to Kill Now because of the first book, or because of the first book. Yeah, second book. I've also heard that uh, Roger Zelazny broke the Amber books to pay the bills, and he wrote everything else. Why? Well, and, and sometimes if you're lucky, you're an author who can get into that situation. You've got your Pay the Bills books that you're perfectly happy to write, but then that lets you write, you know, A Night in Lonesome October, or, you know, uh, the Sandell books, which maybe aren't going to sell as well. So, I guess to take things back to emotional manipulation, I, have, I wonder about, um, I guess, how much leeway do we as writers have for plundering the local news or the daily news for, uh, I guess, for for our stories. As yeah. much as a lot of order does. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day and I was, I was writing a short story and it's about um, 
I guess if there, if there were a high concept to it, it would be my dad adopted a sociopath. And it sounds like one of those after giving special type of stories. <laughs> 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 like one of those. One of your yeah. Which and, made a heck of a lot of money. Yeah, and I wonder, like, okay, um, this kind of thing is really quick to establish in a story like this. Are readers going to say, like, Oh come on, you're cheating! Like that's is it cheat basically? Like how do we determine what is cheat? Um, I guess in the world of genre fiction specifically, are they going to catch you at it? Yeah, are they going? Uh, are they I going mean, to look at it and say, "Oh, he pulled that off the morning news a year and a half ago"? I remember that instance. Right, and are they going to care? <coughs> yeah. So so yeah, how well can you bury it? And are you actually going to call it so my dad adopted this? <laughs> because it might be too obvious to It's a great job to do. Yeah. Um, it's a contract, though. <laughs> for a lot of the emotional feedstock for stuff I write, I rate my own experiences in high school. I mean, high school is like a gold mine for drama. Yeah. And it's not copyrighted. Nobody would ever catch that. I was mostly unconscious there. <laughs> <laughs> I was mostly putting in my time and trying to get out. Yeah. So, so yeah. I was yeah. To do that. Of course, there's it, one thing to remember about using your high school experience is that things change over the decades. And another is that not everybody went to the same kind of high school. I mean, I grew up between two places of a few hundred people each, and if the high schools weren't exactly like in, in big city high schools. Yeah, yeah there, there is that. I mean, you know, how big was your high school? Um, 2,000 students, I think. Okay, what was your graduating class like? How many, what do you think, give or take? Oh, it would be about a quarter of 2,000. Okay. <laughs> no, <it's laughs> not yeah, 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 where I went to high school, mm -hmm. my graduating class was 744. Okay. And when my kids went to school, their graduating class was 60. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Yes. You. <laughs> also, about the graduating class of 500 or so. 2000. I had a graduating class of nine. <laughs> wow. I went to high school in a town of 150. So, it's about the size of the one I live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, probably yeah, very different before. experience. I probably had a very yeah. different high school experience. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. There is no crowd to disappear into. No. Yeah. But Absolutely. there is one thing that is the same across all of it is the emotions that we all feel. Right. So it doesn't matter if you go to a school or nine more or 700 or 2,000. Mm -hmm. It, it's that feeling of segregation or separation or being odd or whatever. It's going to be, you know, even in your class, you had you had to stand out. You didn't want to be there or whatever. I mean, it's just that, you know, it's, univer it's a universal feeling. All of us have this universal sense of wanting to belong, wanting to be loved, wanting to feel compassion, you know, and, right. and it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just how do you put that together and how do you draw your reader into your you know, into those feelings, because to me, even if the story's not so bad, so good, and the characters aren't so are great, but if they, if the writer has brought in the emotions of what this person is feeling, I'm, 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 I'll go along for the ride, you know, and I can put up with a lot of stuff, but if they're getting, getting me to feel stuff along the way, it's like, okay, let's go, let's see what happens, but if he, you know, if that's not there, it makes it harder to go on, even if it's a good story. Kids from the Rise great book, and not that many people went to prep prep school. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So maybe a good question to ask about, like, hey, how do I go about um, manipulating people's emotions? Yeah, uh, it's to ask, like, whose emotions it's going to be, mm -hmm. and I guess what your own personal reasons are. If you're wanting to impart some sort of knowledge or some sort of uh, wisdom, like on, uh, you know, like on the team, like on team population, somebody graduated. High school, for instance. Um, yeah, that could totally change, like, uh, what you end up putting in the book. So then you have to stop and think about who are you writing for, I guess, and you're considering what your audience is now, yeah. and what I can do, you know. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's also, yeah, there's, that audience. there's a personal, I guess, motivation element. I, think. I 
motivation is I want a contract for another three books. Exactly. Like a politician. So is it is it popularity? Is the motivation that we should all have kind of as an underlying thing? Or I mean, I wonder. That most of the argument about writing to market or not writing to market. Mm -hmm. I, I, I write because I like the emotional aspect of writing. I love what comes out in the sense of like, I want to share it, I want other people to read it, but I want to read it, I want to know how the story ends. For it's, I write most of my stories that are for me because I want to I know what's going on. You know, this person is doing this and I want to know. Well, do they do they get to the girl? Do they get the guy? Do they get killed? You know, I want to know. So you're very character driven. You're very yeah, character focused as a reader, yeah. and that translates over to you as a writer. That's them. correct. Okay. So, you know, and that's what I write for myself. So, I'd like to point out an um, example of um, a movie that's made me feel something I haven't felt before in my personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, so. And this is probably on the way opposite end of the spectrum of popularity. Uh, it's, the movie is There Will Be Blood. Um, I think the movie is confusing for a lot of people because um, it's about a guy who's very self-driven and entrepreneurial, and he's very self-directed, and he's doing all these really horrible things to people in order to get what he wants. He's, he's usurping um, this the land from underneath this church, he's also um, just flat out murdering people at times. And as you're watching it, you're wondering, well, you know, I want to root for that guy, but he's just really awful and horrible. And I need somebody to root for in order to me enjoy a story. So it's, um, I guess, it's an example of, of Emotional manipulation, and I think at a, at a pretty high and almost abstract level. So it's it's you know it's uh, uh, it's manipulating in a very uncomfortable way that I think resonated with the critics at least. I think the movie got you know uh, it got the Academy Award for Best Movie that year. So it could be an interesting example, like a case study. I think what you're bringing up, which is. is you know, what gets people drawn to anti-heroes, to me, is where you're really pushing this whole issue. Why are you drawn to mafia? You know, the, the classic would be, you know, the Sopranos, the Godfather. These people are terrorists. They are criminals. They're mafia. They kill people. They extortion. All that fun stuff. You know, why are we drawn to them? And then this gets back into that list when you go, okay, how do you first introduce them? Now, there's like other exceptions. Uh, House of Cards, I'm not saying watch it, but that's an example where it's a detestable first scene um, that's using the Save the Cat, which is an interesting book if you want to read it. Like, how do you, again, get um, empathy with people, or how do you, how are people drawn into a story? You have a save or a detestable character, you, they save the cat, okay? Or, in the case of the House of Cards, they don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, the playing with that, and anti-heroes, I, I think what you're touching on here is right. They, to me, are the most fascinating. You can make an anti-hero um, have an audience root for them, despite some despicable actions, then, like everybody else, is easy to <laughs> me. Uh, but I, I find that very fascinating, studying anti-heroes. Do we, do we always want somebody to root for? Is that kind of the core thing? With us? Just, just wondering. With, as, as readers, as consumers of entertainment? Do we, want, do we absolutely want that one person we can root for and identify with? I think the question would be what percentage of, of readers need a person to root for, yeah. and then kind of by genre. Right. Because I put, I've tried Game of Thrones twice. I've stopped in the same point when I haven't ever finished the book. Because I found out I need someone to root for, and sorry, sure. everybody's here is going to die. I, 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 <laughs> I do, but I know a lot of people don't. Yeah. Yeah. Must not, because it sells a lot of books. Well, even yeah. you know, like Game of Thrones. There are a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the, the gimmick with anti-heroes is you make, like, or even, like, more horrible persons uh, that you surround them with. They're even more despicable. Right. So they're, they're quote-unquote, heroic heroes in that setting. They're just not as ruthless as they are. They are a lesser, <laughs> right. a lesser They right. save no. the cat. They're a you know a mobster who saves the cat from the burning house. <coughs> they light the house on fire. They, they grab the, the house, cat yeah. and carry it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the character doesn't have to be someone you'd want to invite to dinner <laughs> to be captivating. I, I think a lot of the appeal of the anti-hero 
is the, the freedom that they have and, and to, well, you know, blow away that guy who cut it in You wish you could do that. You wish you could do that, right? <laughs> um, so now we're wishing for that. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. my sister mm-hmm. took me to reading a book called Defending Jacob. It, it is like a way runaway bestseller. It, it had like thousands of reviews on, on, uh, on Amazon that were huge. I couldn't hardly read it. She, the, she, wanted, she said the ending came out of left field. I did not see it coming. I want to know what you think about the ending. So I had to read it all. <laughs> it was so depressing. That was the most depressing book I've ever written in my entire ever written. Really? Red, red. Yeah. <laughs> I got it out. Yeah, <laughs> that I read the red. Yeah, it was horrible, and and I had to read like three romances in between, so wow. I could just. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, it's like oh, I go back to it with dread. You know, <laughs> and I thought, why do people want to read this? It was full of emotion. There's no doubt about that. But none of it. There was no light spot. There was no sidekick. There was no <laughs> up part. Ever. Right. No. Well, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not somebody who I like. I, I kind of need to care about someone to want to read a, a story. Uh, I don't necessarily have to love them or think they're a wonderful person, but. If if I'm indifferent to people, then they're you know I'll put down the bag. Yeah. And and so so uh, you know I I tend to prefer having someone I can like and identify with. But but if not, then I have to care for some reason. Emotional response. Yeah. Or maybe it it is not antipathy. It doesn't have to be the protagonist. Yeah. Right. Or, or the protagonist could represent something bigger that you care about more than this particular person. Okay, like well, the, uh, like or the anti-hero that, could represent justice. Or, you know, perhaps uh, you, uh, you want uh, the villain is the person you identify with. That works for some uh, stories. But well, then I, then I think you have to identify with the villain some or he's not a very good yeah. And then you have uh, novels like the Gormenkast series, where basically you have a villain protagonist named Steerpike, who is you know, he's the agent of chaos among this family of royalty who are all you know, start raving bonkers in one in one manner or another. And yeah, you know, the first two novels are basically. As Thirty versus these mad noblemen, and then it's and yet it's a uh, considered a classic. Is that the case of a bad guy among the worst guys? Well, Thirty Bike is a sociopath. He's out for himself. Kind of simple. It's and you know the the no, the the grown family. They're not bad. They're not really bad people. They're just. They're, they're not. They're not playing with a full deck. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a reader, what is something that you just, if the author does it, even if they have built trust with you up to that point, and then they do it again, what is what is a thing that just breaks your trust automatically? I, I, I'll throw a personal example, um, and. Adam's a nice guy, he's a friend of mine, but in, in Adam Stemple's book, he did a thing. I hadn't been really liking his character that much to begin with. He was trying to write the anti-hero, and, and I really thought, you, you're not quite there, you're just mostly got a sociopath. And, <laughs> and, and then there was this thing with Grandma that happened, and I'm like, yeah, dude, done! And, and uh, so what's a thing that makes you be done? That even, no matter how much trust you have built up with that, read, with that writer, you hit that and you're like, nope, done. Oh, Cats yeah. for me sometimes can be it. I, I, I'm a big softie for animals and, and save the cat. Well, yeah. for a lot save of, the cat, I'm done. For a lot of people, an example of that would be Thomas Covenant by Stephen Marco. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So I was thinking done. about him a right while there. ago. Yeah. Well, and you didn't. You, and that's a situation too, though, where I think where the author did not spend enough time building trust with the reader yes. about this it was character. Too early. Yes. Yes. It yeah. was too early. He did not build up that trust. Well, on the other hand, if he had, I mean, wouldn't you then be saying, okay, well, he led us along? Yeah. yeah. But then I might could say, why did this character I trust do this horrible thing? What flaw happened here that I missed? Because it's an important part of his character. It's yeah. Blood. Yeah. It changed it. Yeah, he's a self-pitying asshole, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, he always will be. <laughs> and I don't care if he saves the realm. I'm still uh, never going to forgive him for it. <laughs> Anybody else? There's uh, there's more controversy around that series, I think, than than a lot of anything else. Yeah. I don't know if you've read Misery. Yes. Uh, remember uh, Annie, who's the you know Stephen King. Uh, I. I'd love to call this the, the, the stories I'm reading or watching or I'm writing is the cock duty lie point where because uh, Annie is um, the person who kidnaps an author, an author in, in, in the story Misery and there's a point in the they're going serial, watching serial movies and every week they go to the movies and watch the serial and in this one point you know they stop it as the car is going over the hill with the, I think it was a detective, in the car, and it's clear that the guy's in the car going over the hill and is going to die in the car crash. Well, the next week they come back and they show it, and I can't remember exactly how, but he gets out of the car in a, unbelievably, there's no way, and Annie jumps up in the movie and goes, it's a cock a duty lie, <laughs> and starts yelling at the, t at, the, at the movie because it's just so far-fetched. TVPros.com <laughs> calls that a cliffhanger pop-up. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yes. This guy could get out of the car before it went over the cliff. There's just no way. Well, that was so, with JR. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Bobby Ewing, technically. Yeah. So, yeah, Bobby Ewing. So, and it's also, I just, it's that cock a duty lie point where you just go, no. No, I, I'm done. I can't believe that that would not happen. I think, yeah, so much no, of it. Like, or, as they, for me, one point of that was, like, Revenge of the Nerds, the point where, uh, where one of the, uh, one of the nerds ex uh, explains why nerds are better at sex than football players. <laughs> I mean, it's because, Nerds think about sex all the time, well, and football players think about football. <laughs> <laughs> I have been both those things. Just so you guys know. Uh, I, I was in chess club, and I was also I was also a high school football player, and and I was a college baseball player, and baseball and chess were fourth and fifth, and and. Sex was way up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just okay, saying. here's an example of one that the the the, 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 the uh, like using faith in an author um, in uh, writing a sequel to uh, Silence of the Lambs. Mm. When when he has. Uh, uh, Clarice Sterling fall in love with Anna Lecter because of all the things he did to her. Uh, I thought, uh, well, that's just, that's more of a, it's like, I don't really believe that Clarice would fall in love with Hannibal. I think the author fell in love with yes. Hannibal. And Hannibal is a very fun character because he does the things that, uh, Many of us wish we could do to those we dislike. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, wish you could although I, you know, personally, I content not to eat them. But uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's actually a completely different explanation for why that happened. That I, that's really irrelevant to this, but that I happen to know. So. Oh, and, and uh, you know what? Okay. <laughs> What's your point? Yeah, I think shock for shock value. Sometimes that's what loses. Yeah. It's an obvious gimmick, like, okay, we've got a, you know, um, uh, like Dexter is an example, another anti-hero, but that started over, the, I, I gave up on that series, I didn't read the book, but the you know, TV uh, series where, okay, how many times, how many ways can you kill somebody, you know, a serial killer, do this, you know, 
Uh, and that's a serial killer surrounded by good people, which is a, you know, an even more extreme example of an anti-hero. Why are we drawn to him? premise away it's like okay because he only kills bad people okay well then he kind of drifts in the series a little bit but um, it's a fascinating from a writer perspective to understand why people are drawn to Dexter and then again also a lot of we even lost me for Dexter like okay this is this is just getting ridiculous now so so writer would kind of touched on something there that you know when we're talking about emotional manipulation and we talked a little bit about as a reader, being emotionally manipulated by the writer. And we've talked a little bit about, as a writer, emotionally manipulated as a reader. But she kind of touched on this when she talked about how her author fell in love with this character, maybe a little too much. So how do we avoid, as writers, being emotionally manipulated by our own work? by falling too much in love with something we're doing, or falling too much in love with the character that we have created. One of the authors that Chris and I went and saw, uh, Fluke, Joanne Fluke, she wrote a cozy mysteries with recipes. But she she wanted to write a cookbook and wanted her to write mysteries. So she said, if I can put in recipes, I will. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but That's what weird. what she did was um, no, I can't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> oh, what was talking about to start with? How to avoid getting too emotionally involved with your. Oh character. yeah, she said if she has a part in that she's written mm -hmm. in a book and she loves it, and when people say you know read me something, she wants to read that. She said I probably should cut that because I'm too attached, and that means it's tripe. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so that's that was a new thought for me. I had to mull that one over. I think you have to uh, you have to be fond of your own characters for uh, in in some uh, way. I think it's something about Bella that it's almost like you you have to let the you let the characters go like almost like you have to allow them to grow up or something you have to allow them to be hurt mm -hmm. um, because well, if you don't you have to hurt them right yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 it's like if, if if you don't subject them to uh, the kind of things that the world throws at a person uh, then they won't be able to stand on their own. And the worst things that the world throws at Because I freely admit, as an author, I've had that moment where I've been writing along and going, I don't want to do this to this person. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. They don't deserve this horrible thing that I'm about to do. God, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> No, actually, I'm an author. Okay, well, I'm a terrible host. <laughs> well, somebody, can you hold for a minute? Somebody um, had mentioned something about, just muttered something about editors, and for me, that's the big thing. Yeah. Having a reader. Somebody who tells me, you know, this character is too perfect. This is what you wanted to be in high school. Okay, point. I don't like that you told me that. I hate you for telling me that. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and that's, that's, the big thing, having somebody, for me at least, having somebody who can tell me, okay, bad things have to happen to this person or I don't care about what you're writing anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, um, has anyone written a, um, okay, uh, there have probably been stories in a way at, about writers whose characters rebel and kill them. <laughs> I'm sure in there art. has been. What? Inkhart. Um, her, the author's name was German. Cornelia Funke. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What? Cornelia Funke. Inkhart. 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 Yeah. Okay. Mm. It's a good book. Okay. All right. Well, so, I know okay. in one of my stories I was writing, and it's about genetic mutations, and this one character, and it was just driving me nuts, and I could not. I mean, I can't even put my finger on to this day why she was driving me nuts. And I wanted to kill her. I mean, it was just I, absolutely okay. You know, people are going to get us just to kill her. And I could not do it. And then finally, I'm still riding along, and she's in it. And then she mutates. And I fell absolutely, totally in love with her. And the, part of the reason I fell so deeply in love with her was because I hated her so much before. Uh. You know? <laughs> 
And I think it had an effect on the way I ended up creating her mutation and the way she changes because she was just this annoying little person through the whole thing. I, I think that as, as a writer, I haven't had too much problem with this, but, but I think that if you find yourself strongly wanting to, to have the character, you know, experience certain things, you know, this, this is what should happen to this person, that's just the one thing that you must not do. And so, you know, note it down, and then figure out a way to reverse it. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, try that and see how it works. <coughs> hmm. There's this um, advice of murder your darlings, and I think, uh, I feel like it applies to characters just as much as it does to, like, chunks of text and paragraphs and stuff. Like, if I, I don't know, I mean, personally, when I find that I'm liking this paragraph too much and um, I'm pouring like, a lot of time into this thing, uh, that's like the number one sign that I should actually just delete it altogether <laughs> and just move on with the story. Just to tamp down on the complications. Writing is hard enough as it is. Although I think George R. R. Martin might be doing it a little bit with extreme prejudice. <laughs> I think I think he is actually responding to falling in love with his character. You think so? By is he becoming attached to that character and so he whacks him? Basically, just I like this person too much. I kill him. <laughs> Must not be much around Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> Either that or he is in love with one particular character more than the others and can't have them outshadow that character. Oh, interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. I don't. I in reading his, I feel like he actually cares about his characters. It's not just I wrote all these characters to murder them. Mm -hmm. You know, there, he actually put something into them, which may make him the most horrible person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> He's really incredibly nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> just so He's really incredible. No, I, I get. Nice I get the sense that he does care about. Mm -hmm. uh, the people in the story, because if he didn't, then that the story would be unbearable, mm -hmm. and and people would qu quickly lose interest. Because it's like, yeah, if it, if, it's, yeah. if it was just like random carnage, and right. if if it was uh, people that uh, I don't know, it's like a bunch of anonymous people being sure. wrote down, uh, well, okay, uh, I guess there's more going on somewhere, but. Uh, yeah, it's like you meet so many different people, and it, I think it's, I don't know, at, at, at this point it just seems like, um, um, you know, sometimes I get frustrated with the sheer number of people he's throwing at you, um, uh, even though there's a process of attrition going on, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but it's like, he's doing something right. <laughs> Well, the characters are brought up before, you know, having multiple characters and when is it too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, a series that I read, book number five is the first one that I read. And it was just too busy. You know, it, mm -hmm. there were too many characters, there was too much going on, and, and it just could not keep me. Right. And so I told my friend who, you know, that I read this book, that I just, you know, I heard it was good, but, and she said, you need to read from the beginning. I said, I don't even like five. Why would I like one? <laughs> you know? yeah. Right. So, but I did. She talked me into it, wore me down. She had fewer characters in the beginning. By the time I got to five, again, I couldn't mm -hmm. wait to read it again. Right. And then keep going. But you got to be careful because if it hadn't been for my friend who read the whole series and wore me down, I would not have read that series. I think that's one of the dangers you get into in a long-running series. I and mean, yeah. you, can, you can look at something. I've been waiting for the uh, Honor Harrington series finally. And uh, there's a lot of characters. Boy, I'm at book seven, eight now. And there's a lot of people. And if he'd started there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just killed a bunch of them. But <laughs> there's a lot of people to keep track of. But I can keep yeah. track of them now because I started right. at the start. Because, yep. because somebody handed me Basilisk Station and I said, Michael, I know that you are a sucker for ensemble casts and band of misfit hero books here. <laughs> <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> On the other hand, the first Nero Wolf, uh, Rick Stout's first Nero Wolf novel is not very good. 
But sometimes you got to read that not very good novel to get that groundwork. Yeah, yeah. Well, but not all of them have, you know, an increasing yeah. cast as mm -hmm. the series goes on, like the Resident Files, for instance, my yeah. yeah, all-time favorite. Yeah. He has a huge cast, but he only has a few in each book. Right. Pratchett. So Pratchett does the same thing. Yeah, Pratchett has a monstrous cast of characters. Mm -hmm. He just goes with that books. So we're getting not quite close on time, but I'm just thinking, what else have you guys got that you would like to, to touch on, kind of within the topic? Who's got his hand up? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I feel like um, when it comes to emotional manipulation, um, your eagerness has a lot to do with it, and maybe this is touches on like. Um, your love of the characters or your love for a certain kind of event or whatever um uh i i feel like a good sort of general advice is just don't be too eager like don't start the story off with um the fall of rome and then <laughs> spend three nine hundred pages like just petering out from there um that's all i gotta say <laughs> then i think that falls under like one of the new writer mistakes that young writers new writers whatever writers, you can be young readers, and still be a young writer, new writer. Mm -hmm. um, one of the mistakes that they get into is they've got these really cool ideas, and they might actually be really cool ideas, and they want to get to them. Yeah. But the problem is you got to build up to that cool mm -hmm. So, yeah. Jason? I would, I would say that, and I think this applies to a lot of things, that the key to good emotional manipulation is to make sure the reader doesn't feel like they're being emotionally manipulated. Right. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> no, this is great. Well, you're I supposed to have a relationship it. with the reader. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing? It's not being material. So I'm curious. Don't say, this is a puppy. You will love this. So what are, are there any tricks to hiding that kind of thing? Like, um, I, uh, I, when a, when a, when, I guess when a reader sits down to read a book, they, they want to be manipulated, right? Um, but is there a trick to, I guess, manipulating them, even though they want to be manipulated, without making them feel manipulated? Like, is there, I don't know, is there a way to hide the art? Well, and I was wondering how point of view can sometimes maybe be used as a tool for that, to disguise it, or heighten it, or to make it worse, or whatever, mm -hmm. too. That's a little too, kind of a, a vague topic in some ways, but I, I played around with point of view, or again, your framing device, and that mm -hmm. can help a lot, like the short story I brought, and I changed, a, changed, did a little tweak, and that was like, you know, the third very different version I had of a short story, and it took it to a fourth or 4.5 before I, the story is pretty much the same, characters are pretty much the same, but in order to manipulate it or have people get drawn in a little bit better, I needed um, the way that the story is told, either through a, through a characters, you know, with a first person type thing, or a third person or some other framing device um, uh, that you can use. So that's another X factor here we haven't really touched on. So I don't think we also have some comments that are out there, but that helps me playing, even with a novel I switched to point of view one time, it really helped me. It sucks because it's a novel, you got a lot of words invested and you got to redo it, but it did help me as a writer, I think, so, or to help the story. Show, don't tell is, is a really good uh, rule of thumb for if I tell you so and so is angry, that doesn't, uh, right. I mean, I'm just telling you, but if I say they threw things around the room and you can fill in, you know, how they're feeling for yourself, that kind of pulls makes you fit the emotion into the story yourself instead of the author putting You're it there an for you. Reader. you have to yeah. So it's a lot of times it's the things you leave out. I, I have a show. So um, actually that reminds me about, uh, uh, so there's a trick that uh, Chuck Palahniuk, uh, he, he doesn't go so far as to advocate it, but it's something that he uses for his first person stories and maybe um, uh, a good case study of this would be his story Guts. Uh, it's called Subver Subversion of the Eye, in, and um, it's intended to solve a problem with a lot of first-person stories, which is that the moment you see the eye, uh, some part of you thinks, okay, this guy's full of himself. So the way to subvert that is, um, is to start the story off where you don't refer to yourself immediately, but you refer to your friend or this place or um, some other way that the story kind of can set up and build momentum before that first eye shows up in the story. So um, I guess that's about it for tricks that I know. 
I've seen other writers use that trick. Conan Doyle used that trick. Cat Blanty uses that trick a lot. She writes a lot of first person. That's one of her favorite tricks. So, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm primarily a pantser, and so this might be a little self serving. But I, I think that a lot of times when the manipulation is too obvious, it's because it's been planned in advance and not enough work has been done to, to make it uh, justified. We, ex we had planned for this character to die in chapter three, and that was to be the motivation for this and this and this. And, and um, the, the way I work normally is more like I, I go along and I'm you know, figuring out, okay, what does this character want? What are they going to do next? What does this character want? What are they going to do next? And then maybe sometime in chapter three, I realize, yeah, I really should kill that one off. And then I might have to go back and do a little rework to justify it. But I, you know, I didn't know that was going to happen. And so I had put the work into it. Um, I think that introducing the character's complexity slowly is also important. Because as we know, when we first meet somebody, you see the first face that they present. And then the longer you know them, you see them in different situations and you see different faces. Mm -hmm. If you can convey that through writing, yeah, I like that. It's a lot more yeah. Trying to introduce it all at once or trying to do about it. Because that's the way we learn about people. I mean, I so I'm at a birthday party last night and I'm sitting next to my friend Alistair, and I've known Alistair for a long time, okay? And Alistair is a concert violinist. He works with the Minnesota Orchestra and Symphonia and what and I borrowed a music stand from Alistair and I broke it. Okay? And so I'm sitting next to Alistair has some bad music. And so I offered to buy him a new one. And he looks at me and he says they break all the time. You know, you, you, one falls down, you drop it. You're trying to learn a new piece very quickly and you can't, and you kick it across the room, and it just breaks. <laughs> <laughs> and he says in this very deadpan, matter of fact, British voice, <laughs> and I just learned something about Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that gets into contradictions. Uh, contradictions, and, you know, again, a cliche example is some, you know, a mass murderer walks out of the house and then, you know, he started the, the house on fire, burn up the evidence, and then he carries out the cat. Yeah. It's like, whoa, this is a killer, but he cares about the cat. Creating a contradiction, it's like, this is a complex person. I don't understand how they work, and that creates intrigue. Maybe you're not interested in them or uh, you know, sympathetic for them or like them, but you're intrigued by them, and that's part of the manipulation. Although it only, it only works if you can convince the reader that uh, both things fit this character. You you can't just um, throw every characteristic you might want in a particular person in one person unless you figured out how the parts fit together in a convincing way. Because I, I, I think that, you know, when Manipulation works is is when uh, you believe in the reality of the characters, and to me, it's if if uh, if somebody just doesn't seem real, then I don't want to invest in their story. And I think that goes back to the, the slow reveal I can be talking about. Which is uh, that what you said made me think that. Um, the reader is the strongest relationship a reader will have with the character is one where they feel that they were the one who put in an investment. So if you open with a character that is not necessarily immediately the obvious, oh, this is a sympathy play character, and then reveal over the course of time, the reader feels that this is something that they discovered, that they built this, that they discovered this new depth, <coughs> new depth of this person, so they will have a higher level of emotional entanglement with that character when something does happen. It's kind of the flip side. Either you immediately disclose characteristics to make somebody empathize, mm -hmm. or you don't to make the, but there are characteristics that will be hidden that the reader will see further on, and that will make them maybe empathize more and more deeply. And part of what works might depend on the length of the story you're telling mm -hmm. as to which character approach you want to go with. I'm going to wrap this up here. Um,